uh, section of the presentation. Just a couple of items of business as I get familiar with Microsoft Teams. I will have some time at the end for questions and discussion. Uh, if something really urgent is coming up for you, uh, feel free to use the chat feature. You can use the raise your hand feature and we can get to it. That's great. Um, anything else I want to get to? I think that's it for items of business. All right. Yeah, and bear with me for the first couple of minutes as I learn the um, transitions with the slideshows here, Microsoft Teams. That worked. Yes, good start, good start. So uh, first I want you to think of a, a big question. Um, why study food? Why do our food choices matter? Why do food systems matter? You can just take a few seconds and kind of think about it for yourself. I know in being someone who's been involved with food and nutrition and health for many years now and seeing the food system through many different lenses, I'm of the belief system that our food choices have a ripple effect that really uh, ultimately end up influencing everything. And people hear that and they say, oh, it's, you're exaggerating. But I, I don't think it's an exaggeration at this point. I, I really do think there's a ripple effect and our food choices can influence everything. So we currently have a situation where nearly 1 billion people aren't getting enough to eat, over 2 billion people are eating too much, and then altogether, what we eat or don't eat is the leading cause of death and disability globally. The food system is a major driver of climate change, contributing nearly one third of all greenhouse gas emissions. The food system is driving biodiversity losses, and we're seeing record levels of species extinction, both on land and in the marine environment and raising farm animals and producing highly processed foods is contributing to this deforestation and land use change. There is an interaction between food systems and water systems. 70% of water withdrawals are going towards agriculture. We waste a lot of food. Out of all the food that's produced, about one third is lost or wasted across the food supply chain. The food system is built on stolen land and exploited labor, and the largest sector of employment in the U.S. economy is the food system. For every human alive on the planet, there are three farm animals, and antimicrobial resistance is becoming one of the most pressing public health concerns. So food is the issue. And in fact, the 2019 Eat Lancet Commission concluded that food is the single strongest lever to optimize human health and environmental sustainability on Earth. The average person in the US eats 1,996 pounds of food each year. What we eat may be the most consequential decision we make in our lives, not just in terms of our health, but collectively in terms of the global economy and the environment. So as you might imagine, these are massive topics, health, food security, ecosystem, sustainability, water use, the global economy. They're complex topics and they're really difficult to cover in isolation. So uh, let me offer this graphic representation of a food system that I, I think will help to really simplify things for you. As you can see, it's very, um, very simple, the food system and how, it inter how it's interwoven with other systems. I always like to show this because uh, when I see a graphic like this, it makes me just want to throw my hands up and say, oh, I give up. It's too complex, but hopefully we can we can simplify it a bit. Today, I'm going to focus on four main dimensions of a sustainable food system, food and the planet, food and equity, food and workers, food and animals. And these four dimensions need to be in place if we want to have a truly sustainable food system. I'll spend about eight or 10 minutes on each one of these. And then, like I said, at the end, we'll open up some uh, time for questions and discussion. First off, food and the planet. Quick status update on planet Earth. We are in an ecological overshoot. Translation, we're using resources faster than they can be replenished and we're creating waste beyond what can be absorbed. So essentially, we're overcharging our ecological credit cards. 
Currently, it takes 1.7 Earths to support humanity's demand on nature. And that 1.7 number, that's a global average. If everyone consumed like folks in the US, we need five Earths to support humanity's demand on nature. I formally apologize on behalf of all Americans, but don't feel too smug. If everyone consumed like folks in the UK, we'd need 2.7 Earths to support humanity's demand on nature. And we're seeing signs of this ecological overshoot all across the world. Mexico City is sinking due to groundwater depletion. Global hunger is on the rise again. Thanks in part to human induced weather changes, sea levels and coastal storm surges are increasing. The planet is warming. Crack in the Antarctic ice shelf grew 17 miles in two months. Rivers are rerouting Canada. Air pollution is killing millions of people, including in the UK. Algae overgrowths are becoming an annual tradition. Wildfires are wiping out important food crops. This gentleman is knee deep in dead sardines thanks to a dead zone off the coast of South America. Rainforests are being destroyed. And according to the latest annual global risk report, you'll see that many of the top risks we face in terms of likelihood and impact are related to the changing environment. Extreme weather events, climate action failure, human environmental damage, biodiversity losses. And as a side note, if you want some light and easy weekend reading, just kick back in a comfy chair and pull up the latest annual global risks report. Not the most reassuring reading that I do each year. The modern food system is a major driver of this ecological overshoot. About 26% of greenhouse gas emissions are coming from the food system. This estimate can be as high as 34%, depending on exactly what you're factoring in. That's roughly the same as all electricity production, so it's a major contributor. 50% of habitable land is being used by the food system. And of this, the vast majority is being used for the rearing of livestock through a combination of grazing land and land used to feed animals. 70% of water withdrawal is going to the food system. And by 2050, it's expected that 40% of the world's population will live in an area of severe water stress. 78% of eutrophication is coming from the food system. And eutrophication, that's when you have nutrient pollution in a body of water. And a lot of this is brought on by the excessive application of nitrogen and phosphorus rich fertilizers. Right now, 94% of mammal biomass on planet Earth is livestock. This means we're squeezing out all other species and causing widespread biodiversity losses. And when I speak of biodiversity, I'm speaking of all other species, and we need all these species around to keep the planet in check. And I'll let this quote from Dr. Peter Desac highlight the importance of biodiversity losses. There's no great mystery about the cause of the COVID-19 pandemic or of any modern pandemic. The same human, human activities that drive climate change and biodiversity loss also drive pandemic risk to their impacts on our environment. So biodiversity is a big deal. Special shout out to plastics. A recent paper from Nature Sustainability shows us the top 10 litter items organized by aquatic environments. You have river waters, shorelines, open waters, deep sea floor. And consistently, the top three items include either food containers and utensils, food wrappers, bags, plastic bottles, plastic caps and lids, all related to the food system. I spent a lot of time this past summer studying this diagram. <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a messy reciprocal relationship of what's happening with the food system and the planet. So I'll, I'll quickly try to summarize what's happening uh, in this diagram. So first off, we have the food system and agriculture and the food system is influencing the planet, climate change, and how the planet is changing, how the environment is changing, this influences the food system. So it's a nice reciprocal relationship. And currently the way we produce food is depleting soil, which can lead to declines in yields. And this often means we have to expand the amount of land that we farm on, depending on how somebody is farming. This can also lead to changes with climate and environmental degradation, which in turn can lead to biodiversity losses. What we also see is less crop diversity. About 7,000 plant species have been used for food, 7,000. Right now, we mainly focus on growing nine. So our crop diversity has really uh, decreased in the last several decades. 
and less crop diversity can drive biodiversity losses and less productivity. But when we have fewer crops we can eat, it also leads us to be more over-reliant on animal agriculture. And when we're over-reliant on consuming animal products, this can drive malnutrition uh, and lead to negative environmental effects. We're only growing about nine crops. This is not very good for our overall dietary diversity, and this can lead to malnutrition as well. Throughout the food system, we waste a lot of food. I mentioned we waste about one third of all food produced, and this has severe negative repercussions for the planet in many ways. And then starting over on this side, we're seeing not only yield declines, but we're seeing uh, an issue with the quality of the food. So we're seeing food that is produced, but it doesn't have as many nutrients, which can also drive malnutrition and lead to higher food prices. Hope you're, uh, hope you're glad that I spent my time this past summer studying that graphic for you. You can hold your applause. Thank you very much. An undercurrent with all of this is a growing human population. There are 218,000 new mouths to feed each day on our planet. We're gonna have about 10 billion people by 2050. Next up, food and equity. And this is a big one, and I don't wanna sidestep uh, really kind of the underlying issue here, and that is there's been a, a long legacy of discriminatory and inequitable policies that have left historically oppressed people to start off with less wealth and property and opportunity than white people. And this has led to massive food inequity and food injustice. And if we want a truly sustainable food system, it must be an equitable food system. Our food choices are influenced by all sorts of factors you can see on this slide, everything from the individual level all the way to the global level. It's difficult to eat more kale if you don't know how to buy it, how to prepare it or how to store it. It's tough to eat more lentils if when you bring them to work or to school, the people make fun of you for eating lentils. It's tough to get food from regenerative farms if your local food store doesn't have that food from regenerative farms. It's tough to drink less soda when every day you see multiple advertisements encouraging you to drink more soda. It's tough to get more local salad veggies when you only have a few dollars each week for groceries and there aren't any government subsidies helping to support local farmers. It's tough to eat a nutritious diet when you're just confused with the onslaught of nutrition research. And if I can remind you of something that comes up all the time with nutrition, it's context, context, context. What someone eats mostly depends on the situation or the circumstance they're in rather than their values, what they care about. And then looking at all these factors too, are any of these influenced by race or class? Yes, all of these factors intersect in complex ways that can lead to inequity in diets. In order to work on food justice, you have to work on social injustice. This is a, a quote from Karen Washington, and when she talks, I listen. What are some examples of social injustices? Persistent race, gender, and class inequities, lack of opportunity to be able to be self-sufficient, self-reliant, lack of land, lack of living wage jobs, lack of understanding the historical context of trauma and power imbalances. And if we don't ad address these injustices, we're done for, food system is doomed. I'm gonna offer three specific examples of food system inequities. Maybe you've considered these before, maybe not. Food security, malnutrition, food apartheid, food deserts, and food system consolidation. First off, food security and malnutrition. Globally, 3 billion people cannot afford to eat a healthy diet. 3 billion. Global population, about 8 billion. So this means nearly one in three people cannot afford to eat a healthy diet. Oftentimes when we hear something like this, we think, okay, so I think the solution is we just need to produce more food. In general, we actually have enough food and resources, especially in developed countries. A better solution might revolve around ensuring everyone is making a living wage, bringing people out of poverty and making food more affordable through government policy. When you can't afford to eat a healthy diet, this can drive malnutrition. And the number one risk factor for death and disability globally is malnutrition in all of its forms. Now I said malnutrition in all of its forms, and that includes a couple of different sections here. It has that purple section, which represents carrying excess levels of body fat. We have a blue section, which represents dietary risks, so that would be not eating enough 
vegetables, fruits, beans, whole grains, nuts, and seeds, and eating too much salt, sugar, meat, fat, things like that. And then the really light blue section, which represents undernutrition, just not getting enough nutrients and energy. Collectively, adding them all together, this results in the number one contributor to death and disability globally. It's a really, really big deal. I'm not sure why everybody isn't talking about it all the time. If you're more economically minded, malnutrition in all of its forms costs the global economy up to $3.5 trillion each year. That's trillion with a T. The second example of uh, this would be food apartheid and food deserts. It's important to consider the different factors in a community, in a neighborhood that can influence somebody's ability to get enough healthy food. Uh, one of the more common ways of the, describing this is uh, food deserts, and they're determined with these four criteria. Household income, distance from a supermarket, vehicle ownership, and availability of healthy food in local stores. Uh, some food equality experts, advocates, they reject this idea of food deserts. Hank Herrera, who is a longtime food justice activist, has been quoted as saying, some of us don't use the term food desert because a desert is a natural phenomenon. Lack of access to fresh, healthy food is not natural, it's not accidental. And Herrera goes on to say, the desert metaphor is inappropriate for conditions deliberately constructed by people. The desert metaphor only diverts attention from the inequitable, unjust condition. Instead of food desert, some prefer the phrase food apartheid. Brooklyn teacher and activist Jacqueline Badiaco has said food apartheid is a relentless social construct that devalues human beings and assumes that people are unworthy, unworthy of having access to nutritious food. Food apartheid affects people of all races, including poor white people, although black and brown people are affected disproportionately. Under these conditions, which are overtly abusive, whole communities are geographically and economically isolated from healthy food options. Goody Mob was talking about this relationship back in the 90s in their song Soul Food. Fast food got me feeling sick. Them crackers think they slick by trying to make this BS affordable. I thank the Lord that my voice was recordable. Not sure if we have any Goody Mob fans. I definitely don't sound like Goody Mob as I'm reciting those lyrics, but important lyrics nonetheless. This map shows the life expectancy in different neighborhoods in Chicago, Illinois in the US. Uh, where you see darker red, that means a lower life expectancy. The average life expectancy in Streeterville, Illinois, is 90, 90 years old. The average life expectancy in Inglewood, Illinois, just 10 miles south, is 60 years old. 90 years old, 60 years old. And these neighborhoods are about 10 miles apart. So think about what some of the factors might be that that's driving this 30 year gap in life expectancy. And I think, again, this speaks to some of those uh, deep challenges we have in our society with hundreds of years of oppression where BIPOC people are starting off with less wealth and assets and fewer opportunities. And when you're in that kind of situation, it can drive communities that have more unemployment, less access to nutritious foods, lower rates of physical activity, higher rates of smoking, and all of this can drive chronic disease and premature death. My final example of this would be food system consolidation when we're talking about food and equity. We have a food system that is becoming highly consolidated, and this is happening from seed all the way to our plates. Four companies you can see on this slide, Bayer, BASF, ChemChina, and Corteva, they are providing about 60% of all seed sales right now, globally. These four companies now have tight control over the chemical inputs that can be applied to the seeds, and this can drive up prices for farmers and reduce farmer autonomy. Plus, this can limit the amount of diversity we have in terms of the crops that we're growing, so it can lead to potential uh, crop disease and collapse. Another example would be at the grocery store. When you walk into a, a major supermarket, you see all these different products, tens of thousands, and you think, I have a wide, array, uh, a wide array of choices. And really, it's an illusion of choice because on the back end, it's very consolidated. In the US, 10 companies own pretty much everything, and there's a lot of power that exists within that. Final example would be on the farm. You can see here that starting in the 1930s, there was this massive decrease in the number of farms, while at the same time, 
the size of each farm was increasing. So fewer farms, bigger farms. Right now, 5% of all farms produce 75% of all sales. And there's been a similar trend in the UK where the size of each farm is increasing. And a big part of this relates to land ownership. And you might be thinking, eh, land ownership, farming, uh, who cares? Like, why does any of this matter? What's the big deal? Well, I'll let Malcolm X sum up the importance of land access. Revolution is based on land. Land is the basis of all independence. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. You have to go all the way back to 1910 for the height of black land ownership. 14% of farmland was owned and cultivated by black families at this time. Now, as you can see in present day, less than 1% of farms are black owned. Black form farmers were denied credit and other resources essentially forced off their land. And if you want to start to connect the dots with climate action and climate change, many of these black farmers were experts in ecological stewardship. So regenerative farmers were driven off of their land. And this begs the question, how might reparations factor into a sustainable food future? Next, food and workers. When we think of food, we often, or at least me, uh, I used to always just think about food and my health. How is this food going to influence me, my health, uh, my performance, my disease risk, my body composition? And we tend to overlook all the all the different people working behind the scenes in the food system. And human labor is a central component at every step in the food system, which includes growing and harvesting. So that would be laborers in the fields and fisheries, transporting the food. So think about uh, truck drivers, warehouse workers, processing and packaging. That would be bakers, slaughterhouse workers, wholesaling and retailing. That's grocery store cashiers, stockers, and then eating and disposing. So restaurant servers, cooks, dishwashers, people who pick up trash and compost, things like that. We see some of these workers, we interact with some of these people, but many of them and their job site conditions are completely hidden from us. They're in remote agricultural fields, they're behind closed doors of processing facilities, slaughterhouses, in the backs of restaurants, and we don't always get a, a, an accurate view of occupational hazards. And the working conditions for some of these folks can be really, really bad in some cases. Without food system workers, there would be no food. Uh, my focus in this section will be mainly on agricultural workers, those working in the fields, on farms, and those working in meat packing. In the US, there are roughly 2.4 million farm workers. 75% of them are immigrants. The average farm worker in the US makes less than $25,000 per year. 33% have a family income below the poverty line. They have been working for about 16 years in farming, so they're highly skilled, and over half of them have children to support as well. The Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future made a pretty um, in-your-face conclusion with this in, the, in a recent report about the, the state of farm workers in the US, and they said the food system in the US can be said to be built on the foundations of racial capitalism operating to produce wealth for a small group at the expense of public health, the environment, and rural communities. I couldn't find a lot of comprehensive data about the situation in the UK, but some of the reports I saw were not very encouraging and looked to be similar to what's happening in the US and Canada. Almost every food we consume was at some point raised, picked, carried, packed, cooked, or served by immigrant hands. Uh, I read an interesting a bit of information. A Pick for Britain campaign last summer aimed at per, uh, persuading locals to pick fruits and vegetables demonstrated a major problem, and we see this in the U.S. as well. Of the people placed on farms by one major agency, fewer than 4% remained on assignment by the end of the season. Working on farms, doing farm labor, is really, really difficult. Um, it's... Uh, denigrating in many cases, it's hot, you're at a high risk for disease, you're around chemicals. Um, so not a lot of people are able to do it or willing to do it. Food system workers are hurt or injured at higher rates than other workers, and the agricultural sector in particular is one of the most hazardous to human health. Average rate of injuries for private industry jobs, about 3.2 cases per 100 workers. When you look at crop production, this jumps to over five. And when you look at people working in meatpacking and animal production, it jumps to over seven. 
so injuries start to really go up in these farm related jobs. Some would argue that the standards used for counting these injuries uh, are just they're criticized for being too narrow. Not everybody always reports their injuries, so there might be uh, they might be lower than what direct surveys of employees indicate. And how I mentioned a few minutes ago, working in animal processing specifically seems to be particularly traumatic. I think Wyatt Marshall says it best. If you were under the impression that a slaughterhouse wouldn't be the safest place to work, you would be correct. Uh, in the U.S. between the 1960s and 1980s, working in meatpacking actually wasn't a terrible job. Still a bit traumatic, obviously, but it was a decent wage, decent benefits. And then after that, it moved into rural areas where these CAFOs are, concentrated animal feeding operations or factory farms. And it went from being a, a decent middle class job to a dangerous low wage job, really relying on uh, undocumented immigrants. Hasn't really improved. If anything, it's probably gotten worse. Records compiled by OSHA reveal that amputations happen on average twice a week in US meatpacking. Most of the incidents involve the amputation of fingers and fingertips, but there also have been records of lost hands, arms and toes very dangerous. And then more recently, maybe you've heard about this, how the conditions in meatpacking plants have really put workers at high risk of uh, contracting COVID, no personal protective equipment, close proximity to other workers, no time off, no health care, uh, things like that have really contributed to, to poor conditions. When it comes to farm workers managing land and crops, part of the danger includes applying chemicals and heat exposure. This picture is of some day laborers spraying pesticides and insecticides on Basmati rice in Punjab, India. If this is your work environment, eight hours, 10 hours a day, several days a week, this can potentially lead to health problems. Farm workers experience heat related deaths at a rate that's 20 times higher than other civilian workers in the US. More than 1 billion pounds of pesticides are applied each year in the US with farm workers regularly exposed to these chemicals. Each year, farm workers experience up to 300,000 acute illnesses and injuries from exposure to pesticides. Long term exposure to pesticides can lead to higher risk of developing some cancers, neurological problems, metabolic disorders and hormone regulation. If oftentimes when and I'll mention this when I talk about solutions in a couple of days, but when we think about buying, you know, quote unquote, clean food or food with fewer pesticide residues, while that might have benefits for us, I think one of the really big benefits is for the people applying the chemical chemicals, the people working on the farms. And when we're looking at all this, all these statistics, it's really tough to know the true impact here because it's difficult to track low dose long term exposure um, for these farm workers. And then if a farm worker is undocumented, they're probably not going to report illness because they're um, scared of being deported. So I think some of the information is not quite accurate. So it's pretty clear that conditions can be really bad, dangerous, scary. Surely we are compensating these workers uh, adequately and giving them benefits. Now, remember what I said a few minutes ago, average worker in the US and Canada for that matter is getting under $25,000 per year and fewer than 20% are provided with health insurance from their employer. Compounding the already low wages of farm workers globally is what's known as a piece rate system of pay. Basically, this means you're paid for how much you harvest rather than how much time you work. So you could work for 10 hours in a field, but what really matters is how much you harvested during that time, how many boxes of oranges, how many bushels of apples, how many pounds of tomatoes. And you might think, well, that sounds fine, but the potential problem with that is it can really drive um, exhausting conditions if it's a hot day. Um, and if you're, if you need to take a break, go to the bathroom, you're not, you're not getting paid. You're not getting any coverage for that time. One example would be farm workers in Florida must pick nine 90 pound boxes of oranges per hour just to make a minimum wage. That's a lot. That's a lot of work. Uh, so any respite breaks, inclement weather, lightning comes through, you have to take cover, you're not going to be paid for that time. So it's all about your productivity. Out of every dollar we spend on food, about 15 cents goes to the farm and the rest goes to everything else. Transportation, advertising, insurance, packaging, 
And even of this 15%, only a, a very small amount goes to the farm worker who's doing, who's doing the labor. We can shift this uh, in the favor of farmers and farm workers, but it's difficult. You can have things like farmers markets and CSA programs, but you're not gonna have the same volume as if you're going through a traditional supermarket setup. All right, finally, food and animals, and we'll open it up to some questions and discussion after this. This is a picture of a massive cow processing facility in Texas. And this is a picture of a massive cattle feedlot in Texas. In Texas, in the US, there are over 100 cattle feedlots, each holding an average of more than 26,000 cattle. And if you've ever been to a feedlot like this, it's an experience you won't soon forget, that's for sure. When you think of farms and farm animals, what do you picture? Do you picture really small scale pasture operations? Do you picture really intensive feedlot operations like this? These are becoming the norm in developed countries. I want to kick things off for this section with a provocative quote uh, by Tolstoy. Uh, he said, as long as there are slaughterhouses, there will always be battlefields. What do you think he meant by this? My interpretation is how we treat anything is how we treat everything. And if we're willing to uh, treat farm animals as just a unit in a system and cramp them together in poor conditions and be very violent towards them, and kill them by the billions, this may just be an indicator that will be extremely violent towards any living being. Here's a two minute rundown on how farm animal production has changed in the past 60 years. Here you can see the increase in egg production globally since 1961, going from 15 million to over 80 million metric tons. You can see the increase in meat production globally since 1961, going from 75 million metric tons to well over 300 million. And the two uh, big drivers of this, meat from pigs and meat from birds. Increase in milk production globally, more than doubling. For sea life, wild capture fisheries have really plateaued since about the 1980s. What's really increased is uh, fish farming or aquaculture production. In the UK and the US, we become more efficient with how much we get from each animal. We get more eggs per bird, we get more milk per cow, we get more meat per pig. Meat from birds has stayed about the same in the UK, surprisingly. We get more meat per cow. Some would say this is an economic su success story. We just need to continue with this trajectory. But think about some of the trade-offs with this kind of intensification, when you have this all-out effort to get as much as you possibly can from each animal. This is the total number of animals slaughtered for meat in a given year. Went from under 10 billion in 1961 to about 73 billion in 2018. 73 billion animals slaughtered for meat globally each year. And while many animals have stayed about the same with slight increases, the one that's really just skyrocketed is uh, meat from chickens. And those numbers are always a little bit hard for me to uh, comprehend, and this helps me remember it a little bit more. So globally, 108 billion animals are slaughtered for food every 18 months, and this doesn't include fish. The greatest increase far and away is with chickens, and that's the same number of people who've ever lived on planet Earth, 108 billion. So it's it's a number that's really hard to, hard to grasp so much. These kinds of numbers when we're using this many animals in agriculture it makes pastured 100 percent pastured animal agriculture a near impossibility this map of the uk wherever you see a darker orange or red color that's where factory farming or CAFOs, concentrated animal feeding operations are the most prevalent over 70 percent of farm animals in the uk are coming from CAFOs, and this is really the trend in developed countries this is where animals are being raised and coming from and it can really lead to immense suffering. This quote from uh, Yuval Noah Harari from the book Sapiens has really stuck with me. Domesticated chickens and cattle may well be an evolutionary success story, but they are also among the most miserable creatures that ever lived. The domestication of animals was founded on a series of brutal practices that only became crueler with the passing of the centuries. I'll quickly highlight what the factory farming conditions look like for animals. Uh, remember, this isn't 100% of animals. 
it's the majority, but it's not 100%. So I definitely don't want to leave that impression either. When it comes to chickens raised for meat, known as uh, broilers, they have gone through selective breeding, and this has led to really overgrown bodies and short uh, lifespans, life expectancies. The birds are overcrowded and dimly lit, uh, barren grower houses, and this can lead to rapid disease transmission. They can exhibit natural behaviors. After only six to seven weeks, they're sent to slaughter. They can live five to 10 years under natural conditions. Uh, the slaughtering process for chickens can be pretty, pretty traumatic. They go through an electrified water bath before they're killed. Foie gras is uh, particularly um, concerning in the animal welfare community. It's when birds are force fed through a tube that goes down their throat to promote fat accumulation on the liver. And like I mentioned a minute ago, the vast majority of animals killed for food are birds. When it comes to hogs, they're kept in a cycle of impregnation, birth and nursing, and they're often confined in these gestation crates where they can't really turn around and move. They must go, they must go through castration and tail docking, and this is to minimize aggression when they're in these cramped spaces. It also minimizes the risk of infection. For all six to seven months of their life, they are in these pens, then their life ends. They can live about 15 to 20 years under natural conditions. For egg laying hens, they're placed in these battery cages, like you can see on the slide, to overcrowd the space. Each bird has about the size of a notebook paper for space. Um, beaks are cut so they don't peck other birds. They're often subject to forced molting, which is a practice of causing a lot of stress because there's a rebound effect where they can produce larger eggs. Male chicks are discarded because they don't serve a purpose. Beef cattle are often artificially inseminated in order to produce calves. They're castrated, dehorned, branded without pain relief. Um, I know in the US and Canada, and I believe it's the same in the UK, they do spend about two thirds of their life, the first two thirds of their life on a, a pasture. So in a more of a pasture setting, which is great. It's the final one third of their life where they go to a feedlot um, for quote unquote finishing. It's where they try to gain as much weight as possible. At about 12 to 16 months of age, that's when they're sent to slaughter. Cows can live about 20 years under natural conditions, so it's a much shorter life. These cows look a little bit different. These are dairy cows known as Holstein cows. They have a, a similar situation. They go through repeated cycles of artificial insemination, mechanical milking. The calves are taken away after birth to be used in other industries like veal, which presents all sorts of concerns from the animal welfare community. And they go through these periods of um, lactation over and over again, then they're considered spent and sent to slaughter after about five years. Again, they can live to about 20 years under natural conditions. Fish farming, we have a situation of overcrowding. So a lot of, a lot of fish in a small space. Natural behavior can be hindered. Uh, food is often withheld before they're transported and graded and slaughter methods can be quite painful. So step back for a minute as you hear about factory farming and how we use animals in the food system. Think about why we're doing it this way. <laughs> Most humans want the humane treatment of animals. It's one of the few issues that there's nearly universal agreement on. So my question is, why did these operations exist? What's the upside? If there were no upsides, we wouldn't be doing them. So think about why do we continue to have these operations for factory farming? I have one idea said best by Wu-Tang, cash rules everything around me. And price is a, is a huge part of this. One of the biggest arguments in favor of our current animal production model is what it's done to prices. Between 1950 and 2000 for beef, pork, chicken, milk, and eggs, prices went down substantially, retail prices for, the, for eaters, for consumers. And it's interesting to think through this, is it the factory farming model and the lower prices that drove up our meat and animal food consumption, or is it our demand for animal pr production that led to more factory farming, probably a little bit of both. Uh, just if anything, keep in mind when you have a situation where there's a low cost in one area, so you might say, oh yeah, eggs are really cheap or meat is really cheap. Well, that likely means there's going to be a steep cost somewhere else. So maybe animal welfare or environmentally or for the farm worker. Since 2000, Prices for animal foods have started to trend up, but they still are artificially low. I love this quote from Michael Pollan. We have this dilemma around the fact that we have figured out how to make meat incredibly unconscionably cheap so that just about everybody can afford to eat meat two or three times a day. 
seems like a great democratic blessing, but you have to look at how we've achieved it. And the way we've achieved it is not defensible environmentally, morally, ethically, and nutritionally. So if we switch to something like pastured meat, we're not going to be able to eat it as often as we did. We'll probably have to become a special occasion food once again because the price we're paying for it is not honest. What do you think? Do you agree, disagree? Quick mention of egg egg before I wrap up. Egg egg laws have really started to become an, uh, an important issue in the US and Canada. And it's a term coined by journalist Mark Bittman. And these egg egg laws refer to laws that criminalize the undercover investigations that reveal abuses on farms. So if someone wants to document a harmful or abusive practice happening on a farm, in some locations they can't. They will be arrested if they do that. This is a map in the US and you can see where egg egg laws have been passed wherever it's dark blue one two three four five states in one state litigation is pending still but there are five states where if there is abuse happening to animals on a farm and you go and take a picture or take a video you very well could be arrested and punished for that what do you think of that do we want transparency in the food system a lot of food companies say yes we want transparency but then when it comes down to some of these new laws they argue against it. Similar situation in Canada, uh, a few different locations are starting to pass these egg gag laws. As Recline said, I don't think there's anything as damning to our food system as egg gag laws. We should be allowed to see how our food is made. We should be able to bear seeing how our food is made. If the conditions in which we raise animals for slaughter are so awful they can't be seen, then they should be reformed, not hidden by the force of the state. Good news is that there are humane pastured operations and these operations offer uh, farmer autonomy. Animals can express their natural behaviors better for the environment, better for surrounding communities. So it, there's a lot of benefits to this. Uh, and I'll, I'll elaborate on this a little bit more in part two of my uh, presentation in a couple of days. Just have to remember that a very small percentage of animal products are currently coming from these kind of humane operations. If we had a magic wand and we said, all right, starting tomorrow, all animal, all farm animals are going to come from these spacious, pastured, humane farms. Could we produce the same quantity? No. Estimates show that we'd only be able to, about, to produce about half of the current levels, half of meat, milk, and eggs. Five freedoms are uh encouraged from different humane operations freedom from hunger and thirst freedom from discomfort freedom from pain injury and disease freedom to express normal behavior freedom from fear and distress these are what we really are are looking for when it comes to animal animals in the farm system all right we did it uh that's the that's the uh that's part one of the presentation looking at the food system problems. Uh, like I said, it's a lot of bad news, a lot of heavy news, but um, I'll offer a lot of solutions and hope, hopefully in uh, part two. It's it's weird it's to weird say, to that's, say that's great, that's uh, <laughs> but that that is a fantastic um, overview. Forgive me for, for assuming that others might agree with that right off the bat, but I awesome. So before I, I've taken notes for some questions, but before I dive in, Please let me open to the floor to the to the folks who are here and I will share also with the folks who are here the um, link to the Goody Mob Soul Food video so they can get the tone uh, direct from the source as it were. And please, uh, questions, comments. And uh, Andy, please come on in. Hi there. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? OK. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for that talk. It was, it was great. A lot of it was familiar to me, but there was some new new stuff in there as well. Just to say my background is in plant ecology, biodiversity, but also being involved in the environmental movement for, for three decades. I just have an observation and a question. And the first is, in the UK, you talked about the eutrophication that comes through uh, farm runoffs due to fertilizer and we've known about that for a long time and one thing you may know the environmentalist the British environmentalist and writer George Monbiot mm. and he's written a lot recently about there's a, a large area of the UK on the Welsh borders 
which is now given over to uh, raising of poultry, intensive raising of poultry. And that has caused a massive decline in the rivers there because you've got all the runoff. I'm sure you probably know about this, maybe this similar place in America. You've got all the runoff coming from the the waste coming from those intensive plants and the river Y kind of separates England from Wales. It's a huge, beautiful river that's now completely declining in health just due to this intensive production. And it's really, you know, it's really concerning. And it is something that's becoming increasingly known. But anyway, that's just the observation. But um, my question is, having been involved in green politics, is what we often come up against is what's known as deep pocket environmentalism, in that the people who have money have the choice. We can afford to buy the quality products. We can afford to buy the organic, the cattle who've been reared well. And I think most people want to do that. And my question to you is, when we've got countries like the UK and the US, where you showed in Chicago, there's that massive difference in life expectancy. And here in the UK, we've seen it, and especially COVID has highlighted it with the uh, risk and just the life expectancy in general of people. There's a massive difference between the North, which is generally has more poverty and the South. And how can we change the system so that we increase the quality of meat production, but it's not just meat production, like we say, it's intensive agriculture as well. How do we increase those systems while making it affordable for everyone? Because, as you know, I'm relatively well off. I can choose to have quality food. Other people, their biggest concern is putting food on the table. So how do we change the system while still being able to keep the food affordable for those people whose main concern is just putting food on the table for their kids? Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, first, first off, off good, uh, good observation of the poultry operations. I mean, that's it's not only farmers applying a lot of chemicals, it's uh, waste from animals concentrating into bodies of water, creating some some serious problems. Uh, yeah, to your second point, I mean, this this is where I think there's a lot of different theories about how we can improve. Um, people who have the money to make the better choice now is a pretty small area. It's a small group of people. Um, and I think this is where we need to start to get creative with um, what we can do as a collective, whether it's creating neighborhood and community plots to grow food where everybody kind of puts in a dedicated amount of time so you're all kind of contributing to the greater good of growing nutritious food and everybody can take some where you come up with an arrangement to get a box at a certain amount of time or i know a big push in the u.s is to um shape the path and make it so that it's not only people who have a lot of disposable income but if we can somehow have a government policy where we're helping farmers um, produce nutritious, ecologically sustainable foods, and they all, they, that's just the option. That's the option you get at the grocery store. <laughs> so it's not like you go to the grocery store and there's a really cheap one and a really expensive one. One's really bad for the environment and animals. One's really good for the environment and animals. And you get to choose based on your income. Instead, there will be just one choice. And there would be one price point because the price has already been paid, maybe collectively through tax money that's been accumulated or something like that. So, I, I mean, there are all sorts of different theories about how we can do this. That what you describe is what we need to do, though, because if we just leave it up to we, it's just going to be up to the person if they have the money and the bandwidth and they can do it. Well, then that's going to that's never going to be enough people doing the thing, <laughs> making the choice. So it's a great. Great point. Great question. Thank you. Thanks for your answer. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, thanks very much. Um, any other uh, comments, observations, and you're welcome to just share your takeaways as well. So please don't hesitate. 
And while you contemplate on that, I'm going to ask uh, a question myself. Ryan, I did not know, there's two things really in, in, the, in the statistics. One, the first one, the easy one is the big, a third of food is lost to food waste. And most of us, I think, have heard about, you know, waste at, at grocery stores by the time the food gets there. Can you unpack a little bit the stages at where food waste is happening such that we're losing a third of it? Because that must also be affecting pricing because somebody's got to pay for that. Yeah, I talk about food waste a lot. I think about it a lot. And I don't know if I've ever like made my peace with it. Um, it keeps me up at night. Um, so if you imagine the food supply chain starting on the farm, um, transport, grocery stores, restaurants, all the way to our kitchen, we can lose food at any point along this food supply chain. In developing countries, we see food waste happening more early in the food supply chain. So on the farm and during transport, maybe they just don't have the labor to harvest the crop and it rots in the field, or there was a major pest outbreak, or they didn't have the truck to transport the food to market. Early in the food supply chain, that's where we see a lot of food waste in developing countries. In places like the US, Canada, the UK, developed countries, it's at the other end of the food supply chain where we see a lot of food waste, grocery stores, restaurants, and at home. And there's a few reasons for this. One reason is we eat a lot of fresh food in developed countries, fresh vegetables, fruits, meats, seafood, dairy, eggs, and they have a shorter shelf life. So if you buy this, if you're a restaurant and you have it in the kitchen or if you're at home, if you don't use it in a short period of time, it's gonna start to degrade in quality. So you have to discard it. So that's one reason we just eat more fresh food in developed countries compared to think of just staple grains and legumes, dried legumes in, in developing countries. Um, another issue is in developed countries, we have some confusion around the dating on food. So you might buy a packaged food, it has a date on it. We don't really know if this is a safety thing, a quality thing. There's a push in the US to streamline this and make sure everybody's on the same page with it. But there is confusion. So a lot of people might throw away a food that's perfectly fine and nutritious. And then uh, the other big issue in developed countries is that we really just don't utilize food that's perfectly fine and nutritious. Um, people don't eat as many leftovers as they used to. Uh, and I, I suspect this is probably related to our disconnect from food. I, I, we just often don't understand the resources that go into the food, the labor that goes into the food. And so we think, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not in the mood for that. We discard it or whatever reason is there. Uh, so I think, again, if we can start to really make these connections between people and food, where food is coming from, maybe the level of respect starts to increase and we're less likely to waste food. I know, think about if you took the time to have a garden, maybe you have a garden and you grew food and you spent the whole growing season working on growing that food, you'd probably be less likely to throw away that food. You'd probably be like, I need to preserve this or eat it or do something with it. I put all this work into it. And that's that's food. So yeah, that's, that's food waste in, in general. Um, I can tell that it has kept you up uh, uh, at night because you're so articulate about it. Thank you. Yeah, please, if you've got comments or questions, throw up your hands, or I'm just going to keep asking a couple more questions because I'm, I'm pulling out here. Okay, Simran, go ahead. Please turn on your video and ask away. Hi, I had a question. Uh, not exactly a question, but a leading on comment from what you were saying. Um, I don't, uh, so I, I'm from India and I've been, uh, and I'm a PhD student in the UK. And uh, so I, I can give you a perspective from both ends of uh, uh, what you're saying is partially right, but it's also how uh, colonization time and how uh, the uh, diet in the West has changed and um, things like eating more fresh food is also because of the impacts of colonization and the food uh, chain that has been developed, which can ship avocados from a different country towards the West. And uh, in a third world country, it's more local, it's more fresh. And I would say that uh, people still eat a lot of fresh vegetables and things in, in, in the in places like India, uh, but it's, uh, and, and the amount of waste is a little, a lot lesser because of those things. 
um so i think it's it's uh, to do with perspectives as well on how we look at food and food waste uh, rather than just uh, having a very western point of view on things yeah i'm done thank you great point love it and i think the point especially about fresh food coming from nearby versus fresh food in kind of our industrialized system being shipped from somewhere very far yes it's that's they're both fresh foods but they're a lot different um, in terms of who they're supporting and the potential for waste and what we're used to and what's normalized i think that's a great point thank you for mentioning that and that that kind of cues into perhaps we can can prep for your next um, seminar ryan is that uh, for instance really interested in the term food apartheid. I was not familiar with that argument against food desert. It's a term I've been uh, using and, and I'm keen to look into the, uh, another name for it for the reasons given. One of the questions I had, and again, if you're going to be talking about this uh, on your next talk, that's fantastic. Just let me know. But when you talk about context, there's so much going on in a place that might be considered riven by food apartheid from okay suddenly you put in fresh groceries what happens because uh, what are there case studies in that space and what do they show in terms of how readily or not uh, folks are willing to potentially in embrace something that's not part of what would be considered their normal cultural experience and are feeling like they are being done to as opposed to supported with healthier food practices rather than you're you're um, invading our cultural space we've always eaten this way etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah uh yeah that's a tough one I, I i i don't talk i'm not planning to talk much about it in the second part but i can offer uh, maybe a thought or two um that's the interesting thing about this is if you have this situation and you say well we're just gonna put a, a nice deluxe grocery store with the best options like is that going to to change everything for the better and based on what i've seen probably not um just because there are so many factors that have led to that situation and it kind of leads to another thing that can happen in these communities and that's um food gentrification so if somebody comes in that is not from that area and they say i'm going to put in a nice cafe or grocery store and make some money and sell food to these people who need healthy food it's kind of that like we know what's best we're going to come in and you need to buy this and improve your lives type of model or thinking which i'm not excited about and i don't think will help much of anything so again if you can kind of get to some of more of like if the people can um start some community gardens start their own grocery stores and markets and shops and restaurants cafes and like everything kind of builds together in that community um that would probably be more of an ideal solution and but again those are like it gets down to like some deeper deeper things that have led to that so i like it sounds simple to me yeah we'll just put in a grocery store and that'll fix something probably not though it might even lead to other problems so Appreciate that. And do you have time or energy for one more question? Yeah, sure. Let's do one more. Okay. So in looking at the statistics around um, consumption of meat, dairy, et cetera, going up, and especially chickens, uh, one question might be that the, the graphs don't also chart, at least I didn't see that in the graphs, which might be interesting, is is how is this relative to world population or even world areas of of affluence so is is it i guess the question is how proportional or out of proportion is that increase from you know you picked 1960 or somebody picked around the 61 to go up from for a reason so i'm just wondering if if we can see any of those kinds of correlations between population areas of affluence or however you want to cut it to say well you know uh you might this is still not proportional even given those changes over the past uh, 70 years hmm. yeah um yeah because given given a population increase 
more people eating more food, you're going to see an increase in, in overall food consumption, including animal products. I know where it starts to get um, where the association becomes really strong is uh, higher income developed countries. So where the in where people are making a lot more money, they tend to eat a lot more animal products. And I th there's a lot that has gone into why that is. Um, it's probably everything from some people just genuinely would want to be eating more of those foods because they they are dense in different nutrients that people need. And um, if they can afford them, they will buy them. And so when they can, they buy it. Uh, but it gets to a point where we we exceed that amount that can be good and support our health. So I think the strong association is really in in the locations where they're making more money. And I mean, it's interesting when you look at country to country. So there's a handful of countries that really seem to drive up animal food consumption. So if you look at the U.S., the U.K., Canada, I'm, I'm most familiar with those three locations. I mean, they really, really drive up the averages of meat consumption. Um, so... Yeah, I think most often I see it associated with income more than anything. That's probably unsurprising. And also where the agri pressure is for lobbying is also associated with that. Just one other quick comment, Ryan, and, and just to, to see, as I said, I'd stop. But this one, before I forget, is you mentioned pick for Britain. And I'm not sure if there have been other uh, things like that going on, especially during COVID in the States or in Canada around getting uh, food out of the fields. A lot, uh, being aware of the program at the time, a lot of the reason for lack of engagement was the kind of uh, industrialized approach. It wasn't local farmers having the opportunity to hire people to come work on their farms. It was organized in such a corporatized way that people were, you know, kind of like, you're going to stay in this place and not, not leave it for this entire period. And this is, and you know what? A lot of folks who would have participated in that program to do something good for the nation just went, I don't feel like living um, in a, a camp uh, with my movements restricted and access to the outside world right. uh, cut off for that period. So the way it was done uh, kind of shot itself in the foot, despite Prince Charles getting out there and going, Go get some greens for the oh, nation. Yeah. So I'm not, again, I'm not sure what kind of coercion or like Monsanto level control there is over that, or if you don't need to worry about that so much because you can just rely on uh, cheap immigrant labor that's vulnerable for the, all the reasons you've given. Right. Right. That's interesting. I hope I hope we can learn from the <laughs> anybody that's trying these kind of community um, options where we can get people involved in food and harvesting food and providing food. So if we can learn from that for sure. Okay. I, I, uh, I'm just going to say thank you again very much for this and remind folks that uh, Ryan's second talk is on, depending on your time zone, either uh, Friday on the U.S. side or Saturday on the um, Australia-Japan uh, side of Asia. And again, recordings will be available in the Slack channel. So look for those probably tomorrow to be up online for you. And if you have further comments or questions, Ryan's kindly agreed to engage on the Slack channel as well in the Seminar 3 area. So please join us for the conversation continuing there. And Ryan, thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll see you in a couple days. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you, guys. Night now. One day.